Today, I look at how hot my plants are doing after a late season freeze. Plus, you'll be spinning when I show you how to mold a pot of gold. And if you're bonsai for bonsai, then you'll be bonkers for boniwa. Spring started out unseasonably warm here in my neck of the woods. And one day in late March, a local meteorologist declared that there would be no more Arctic blasts. So I stuck my tomatoes in the ground and even went so far as to put all my tropical house plants on the patio. And then all heck broke loose. The day before a scheduled trip to Florida, the temperature plummeted into the mid-30s. So I moved all my house plants back inside and did what I could to protect my tender tomatoes. While basking in the Florida sunshine, I got a text message from Danny, who house sits for me, that the situation was about to go from bad to worse. He wrote that it was actually snowing in Tulsa and temperatures were expected to drop into the low 20s, which would spell disaster. That's D-I-S-A-S-T-E-R for many of my garden plants. Thankfully, the recorded low was only 26 degrees Fahrenheit. So when I got home, I discovered that most of my plants had managed to survive the unexpected early spring freeze. But not all of them got by unscathed. My tomatoes seem to have fared fairly well beneath these fiberglass pots, but I can't be sure. You see, tomatoes can survive temperatures in the low 40s without suffering any tissue damage. But cold temperatures can stunt their growth and shock them to the point where they never fully recover. Now, I could go ahead and replant, but I think I'm gonna wait another week or so just to see how they grow. And my lettuce is just fine. In fact, the cold temperatures actually enhanced its crispness and sweetness. Mmm, sweet! On balance, my ornamental plants did reasonably well, although virtually all of my Japanese maples suffered some damage, especially their tender new growth. For example, the leaves on this green variety obviously succumbed to the freeze as did the leaves on this red variety. That's the bad news. The good news is that although the primary leaves, many of them anyway, have been damaged beyond the point of recovery, secondary buds should produce new leaves so that within a few weeks, these trees should look good as new. The situation is considerably worse for my crepe myrtles because the freeze actually killed some of their top growth. Crepe myrtles, although hardy to zone six, even zone five with some protection, often suffer dieback during severe winters. Now, most of the time, just a few branches are affected, but sometimes an entire trunk may die. It's not the end of the world, however, because most of the time, because the root ball is fully hardy, the plant will develop new shoots that will ultimately develop into new trunks. About all you can do in the meantime is remove the dead wood and cut the dead trunks all the way back to the base of the plant. The tender new growth of this golden rain tree also got zapped, but it'll recover. And last but not least, the tips of my daffodil leaves were damaged, but they finished flowering the week before the freeze. So I'll just leave well enough alone and let the foliage die back naturally. Come next year, they'll be good as new. By and large, I guess you could say I got lucky, or at least my plants got lucky as a result of the sudden spring freeze. But a number of my plants are still recovering from last winter's dreaded combination of extreme cold and drought. And this Akebia vine is a good example of what I'm talking about. Akebia is hardy to zone four. And by the way, for complete information regarding USDA hardiness zones, go to hgtv.com zone. But the top growth of this thing really got slammed during a severe winter. Thankfully, however, new growth is emerging from the base. And in no time at all, this vine should completely cover the cedar. Of course, all that dead growth is pretty ugly, so I'll remove it. A task that's easier said than done. Oh, and one more thing. Although Akebia is a gorgeous vine, it can be a little bit invasive and send up shoots all over the place. So consider carefully where you plant it. This arborvitae also shows signs of winter damage, witnessed by the browning of the foliage. However, it's not unusual for arborvitae trees and shrubs to discolor like this during the winter months. So for the moment anyway, I'm gonna resist the temptation to prune and just see if the plant recovers. Cryptomerias, most of which are hardy to zone five, also exhibit brown foliage during the winter and may look dead, but most of the time they recover nicely as temperatures begin to warm. So again, I won't do anything at this point to these plants. Usually, I'll wait about a month before I take any action. And finally, this bamboo, a bambusum multiplex that's hardy to around 15 degrees, has definitely seen better days. 
The top growth has died, but again, new growth is emerging from the base. So I'll just trim the dead stuff back to the base of the plant. There's one more point I'd like to make regarding sudden spring freezes in particular, and I can sum it up in one word, plastic. A lot of gardeners cover their plants with plastic when freezing temperatures threaten, and it will buy you two, maybe even three degrees of frost protection. But the most important thing to keep in mind is that the next day, as the sun comes out and temperatures warm, you need to remove the plastic. Otherwise, your plants may actually cook beneath it. Periodically, severe weather damages plants. That's a fact of life for gardeners practically everywhere, even in subtropical climates. If you're not sure whether a plant is alive or dead following a severe winter or sudden spring freeze, you can always use the old fingernail test. Just scrape the outer bark of the plant with your fingernail, and if you see green tissue, chances are the plant will be fine. If you see brown tissue and the wood is brittle, chances are it's a goner. If you're not sure whether a plant is dead or alive, your best bet is to simply wait and see. Remember, not all plants bloom or leaf out at the same time. Or, said another way, some are late bloomers. I was too, and I turned out okay. <laughs> well, sort of anyway. Next, see how fired up clay makes a gardener's day. And take a close look at the big details of a little Boniwa garden. HGTV wants you to dream big. Dream big. big. HGTV is making dreams come true. Start at home. The original Bud Classic that started it all. Check out Dad's first starring role. Air Bud Special Edition. You look so young. Now I know where I got my moves from. With an all-new Buddy's commentary. He's talking about us. Air Bud Special Edition on Disney DVD today, rated PG. I sent Julie an edible arrangements bouquet. We're best friends. I also send them as a thank you to my clients. And for entertaining, my guests are always impressed. Edible Arrangements bouquets are gorgeous, made from fresh fruit, and taste delicious. You can even add chocolate. So make any occasion special. Ordering is easy. For pickup or delivery nationwide, visit a location, call, or go to ediblearrangements.com. They damage one in every 30 homes. Find one sixty-fourth of an inch to get in. And cause more than $5 billion of damage a year. Get to them before they get to you. With the ultimate protection guarantee, only from Terminix. It covers all future termite treatments and damage repairs, guaranteed. Call or click today to protect your home. Terminix, power over pests. Well, I was shopping for a new car. Which one's me? A cool convertible or an SUV? Too bad I didn't know my credit was whack, because now I'm driving off the lot in a used subcompact. F-R-E-E, -E, that spells free. Creditreport.com, baby. Saw their ads on my TV. Thought about going, but was too lazy. Now instead of looking fly and rolling fat, my legs are sticking to the vinyl and my posse's getting laughed at. F-R-E-E, -E, that spells free. Creditreport.com, baby. Offer applies with enrollment and triple advantage. Moving my mind and my hands at world record speed. I'm Luke Myers. If you want to be incredible, eat incredible. Eggs. Incredible energy for body and mind. Buying your first home. A big dream for most people. We're ready to own a home. It's time to move on and find my own place. And while times are tough, for these house hunters, the timing may be just right. It's very much a buyer's market here. Follow some first-time home buyers as they make their dream a reality. It's an entire week of all new episodes. House Hunters First Time Home Buyers Week. Tonight at 9 on HGTV. Dream big, start at home. Brought to you by the Home Depot. You can do it, we can help. Do you ever take a good look at your garden containers and wonder, how in the world do they make these things? I sure have. Tom and Devorah Bratton have been running La Honda Pottery for over 35 years, and they're going to show me how to turn a lump of clay into a work of art. All right, Tom, let's, let's start the process, because I'm okay. fascinated. I can't wait to jump in here and see how this works. Well, here's where it starts. Lots of clay. We put it in here. You'll be watching it come out there, and as it comes out... Holy cow! It's like a giant pasta machine. That's exactly what it is. More like a meat grinder. This monstrous machine is called an extruder. We're working with a dense, high-fire earthenware clay 
so it'll mix and work our medium to a good consistency. Moving down the line, we feel the need to knead. This is the same thing as kneading dough, only with dough, a lot of the times what you're trying to do is put air into it so that it has that nice texture and soft and fluffy. When a potter kneads, he needs to get air out. Tom molds the clay into a shape he can work with. It's far from what our final pot is going to look like, but he still manages to make it look good from the start. Tom centers the spinning plate and wets it down. We're going to make a big pot, so we're going to need more clay than this. Bank in the clay. <laughs> and now comes the fun part. Throwing. Keeping his hands wet, Tom centers the rough clay mass until it's perfectly symmetrical. No wobblers allowed. Then he starts forming the base. As we keep wheeling down Pottery Road, I think it's about time we saw this guy's grand opening. Ooh, now that's cool. Poking with a needle tool makes sure the base measures out to a half an inch thick. From there, Dr. Tom tells Clay Patient to keep opening wide. Every time you go up, you should go down a little bit on the top. It, otherwise, the clay up here won't be dense enough and it'll crack. With only a little time and effort, Tom's made the base of a large pot from scratch. Now see, I'm thinking, that's a pretty good looking pot right there. <laughs> this is the start of a, of, of a nice big I could do container. a nice succulent garden in this, mm -hmm. in this right here. Kind of like a walk pot. Before we can add more height, it needs to dry and stiffen up. Tom's 250 watt heat lamp should do the trick. Those are some bright lights. For the next hour, the pot will be set on spin dry on high heat. Once that's done, we're ready to have another go. Okay, Tom, now we've sort of jumped forward in time just a little bit because so. that's the one we just finished, mm -hmm. or you just finished. <laughs> and that has become this by way of some coils that you put on top, right? Exactly. We attach some, a coil, which we're going to do now. You'll see the whole process as we go here. But this is about three coils up. Okay, all right, and we're gonna make this even bigger. Here we go. All right. Before we add another coil to the colossal container, we score the edge and spread a layer of slip to the surface. Slip, by the way, is just wet, goopy clay that acts as an adhesive. This step allows the fresh clay to hold on tightly to the dry clay. We're gonna put a, a, a new die on the extruder, and we're going to extrude out the next, well, we call them noodle, to put on the top of this, and then we'll throw it. That's going to be a big noodle. That's going to be a, a, a long noodle. Okay. <laughs> Whoa! He wasn't kidding. We're definitely going to greater lengths to get the job done. I'm running out of real estate back here. A little bit more. We set the earthen serpent around the edge and attach it like pie dough. When it's on nice and snug, we're ready for another throwdown. Cool. And we're going up. And we're going up a little bit. We've got to put, take the lumps somewhere, so we're taking them up to the top. As you come up to the top, you press down. This coil will give the pot another five inches of lift. The uneven lip is again trimmed to leave it nice and level for the next layer. Next thing, we'll take out this wooden rib, and we'll just smooth it down. Sometimes you want the texture. We're going to do this in a, in a nice, shiny glaze, and we want, it to, uh, we want it to be nice and smooth. From here, we again let it spin dry for an hour, score the lip, and apply the slip, then extrude another dude. When the coil is attached, we're ready to finalize a lip. You know, this is a an art form in which all thumbs is not really a bad thing. <laughs> thumbs, for, thumbs are good for this. <laughs> we just trim it off here and make it round. Let it sit for a while. This beauty will be left alone to dry for at least a week until there's no trace of moisture. Otherwise, it'll explode in the kiln. In extreme weather, it would be stored in here, where temperature and moisture can be controlled. If it dries too fast or too slow, it'll crack, and we'll have to start all over. When it's all dry, Devora sprays on a coat of glaze. It's a silica mix with iron oxide added to give it a nice, deep red color. The process is similar to making glass, so there's no color or a glossy surface until it's baked in the kiln. I'm pretty fired up myself, so let's get baking. Ready? Ready. Up we go. Oh, it's not so bad. And now we'll stack it up, put the top on it. The pot will simmer at a low 1,985 degrees Fahrenheit for 15 hours. When the 15 hours are up, it'll take another 30 to 36 hours to cool. 
But through the magic of television, we don't have to wait that long. Look at that. It's uh, nice and red, huh? I'm gonna get it out in the light. It's pretty amazing how we started out with this and worked our way to this. What a payoff. I'm so pumped, I'm gonna make a piece of my own. Well, maybe with a little of Tom's supervision. Hey, Tom, look what I made. Paul, did you do that? <laughs> well, you're such a good teacher. Coming up, who needs a huge garden when you can create one with size that meets the eye? And find out just how toxic your lawn may be. The plan. We're gonna take the base off. There's gonna be a chair here. Demo the tub. Yeah, I'm gonna saw all this out. It's gonna happen. I don't think there'll be any kind of problem. The reality. Oh, Whoa! That did not just happen. Worst case scenario, the house blows up. Sometimes getting from the before to the oh, after isn't very pretty. He is insane. <laughs> Renovation Realities, an all-new series tomorrow night at 10.30 on HGTV. <laughs> Inside every jar of Jif, you can trust you're getting the highest quality peanut butter. Jif only uses the finest peanuts and adheres to the most stringent quality standards, ensuring that your peanut butter is as safe as it is delicious. Jif, the brand you can trust. Mom, it's the last slice. Well, then let's share. Jake gets to cut. Yes. But Cody gets to choose. Nice. Jif uses the finest peanuts to make a rich, peanuttier peanut butter. I got a pretty big half. Choosy moms choose Jif. Activon for joint pain, muscle pain, arthritis, and backache. Activon, ultra strength pain relief and a convenient applicator, no messy creams or gels. Activon, applied directly where it hurts for joint pain, muscle pain, arthritis, and backache. Activon, powerful pain relief. tilt of the head, every tail wag, our pups know how to speak to us. And with a hearty real beef taste and mouth-watering aroma, only Pepperoni lets them know we're listening. Pepperoni, dogs just know. I can trust my eyes to MagnaVision? I'd stake my reputation on it. MagnaVision, prescription quality reading glasses without a prescription. Great looking styles, affordable prices. Trust your vision to anything but MagnaVision? Not these eyes. Trust your vision to MagnaVision. True or false? Your pet is safe from fleas, ticks, and heartworms in winter. Sorry, it's false. And these guys can mean big trouble. Your pets need year-round protection, plus medications for cold weather joint pain. Fortunately, they cost a lot less at 1-800-PET-MEDS, and they're delivered free, right to your door with a 100% satisfaction guarantee. For fast service, free shipping, and big savings, call now or order online from 1-800-PET-MEDS, America's largest pet pharmacy. We're different in California. We embrace innovation and tend to be on the cutting edge of most things. We enjoy the freedom to live exactly the way we choose. When it comes to rugs, carpeting, and floors, we're no different. California Carpet, exceptional flooring choices for forward thinkers. The ancient art of bonsai could be described as one tray, one tree, one harmonious blend of nature and art. Now let me show you a new take on this old craft, one you might describe as bonsai on steroids. Boniwa is a whole landscape or a whole scene, and on a bonsai is typically a single tree. Boniwa is the invention of landscape designer and nursery owner Hiro Matsuda. Boniwa is a miniature Japanese garden, or a vignette of it. Boniwa is made up of several things. A flat container, soil, plants, rocks, and sukubai, or the humanizing elements. Unlike bonsai, where the container significantly enhances the overall look, Boniwa focuses the eye on what's in the planter. The reason for these being flat is so that it, it is not the integral part. It is just to house the, the overall presentation. The soil should be adapted to the climate. A good basic soil recipe is three parts compost, one part crushed lava rock, and one part sand. But you can personalize it for your own region. 
The local bonsai club is a good place to look for suggestions. For Boniwa plants, Hero says you don't have to worry about breaking the bank. Three to five-year-old specimens are perfect. You could take relatively young plants and it looks great now. And I think that's the biggest appeal is that it's um, quick. Rocks are essential to the art of Boniwa, which is a good thing because there are so many choices. The rock, the plant, and the mounding, or the, the grade, I think, makes up the whole presentation. Now, the sukubai hero makes himself, but you may find miniature tea houses and water implements at Asian import stores. The tools are just your basic bonsai fare. Pruners, sharp scissors, wire cutters, tweezers, and chopsticks. Once everything is assembled, it's time to create. When you take the container, you gotta decide which is your front. Hero uses screens over the drainage holes to keep the soil in place. They're secured with wire pins. The next is the key plant. The key plants are the largest. In this case, several trident maples. I put these three trees together so that they're already a little forest. And then this being the main side will be the highest. If I need a little bit more height, then I could add soil. Japanese gardens are rarely flat, so in miniature, rolling mountains means higher mounds of soil. The secondary plant is a dwarf Hinoki cypress. It should be at a lower elevation than the key plant. At this point, um, it's only a rough fit. It might change as I get to the next step. And I'm going to be adding more soil so that when I get through here, it's going to look very natural and continuous. Boniwa uses much more soil than bonsai, which translates into less maintenance. This will go uh, much longer uh, without having to be repotted than your typical bonsai. Hiro also wants a sense of water in his Japanese garden. He's using lightweight lava rocks to create the borders of a meandering stream. Okay, so now we're going to get the water to flow down this way. As we take a rough look at this, we should have a different view as you move. And that's another key element of how to make this feel bigger is never show the whole thing at one time. To soften the landscape just a little bit, Hero adds a few strategically placed clumps of dwarf sedge grass. Next thing I'm gonna do is to put on the time release fertilizer. The fertilizer package instructions will give you accurate quantities. Spread it evenly throughout the garden. Okay, next, we start the moss process. Hero uses moss harvested from all over his nursery to blanket the exposed soil. When you have large pieces of moss, you want to save it for the most extreme slope. Try to get the big pieces so that the soil won't run off. Now it's time for the stream to reveal itself. The next step is to put gravel in. You can see the entire landscape come together with each addition. The stream brings the landscape to life. And check this out. The water basin, the lantern, the spigot, and the bridge make it look like people have lived here forever. But we're not done. Just like bonsai, Boniwa requires pruning. The growth habit on the trident maple is like this but we want to grow it like that. So you have to prune the top much heavier than the bottom. Pruning will bestow age and definition on the young plants. But you notice that now I have it opened up, more looks like a mature plant. A few Boniwa maintenance tips. When in doubt, prune it out. Oh, and how about this? Go ahead and wire if you so desire. Or my favorite, watering is essential to achieve full potential. But the best tip Hero has for aspiring Boniwa artists? Sit back, relax, and create the miniature masterpiece of your dreams. So I have to use my imagination and say, I would like to visit this kind of place, and then create that. Every gardener wants a nice lawn, and I'm gonna show you how to make it a healthy one, too. Millions enter to win the biggest prize in TV. Who will Win. HGTV Dream Home Giveaway, Sunday, March 15th at 8, 7 central.
for the most pampered Chihuahua in Beverly Hills, a weekend trip is about to go south. Chloe's missing. Hold your tacos. Don't you speak Spanish? Why would I? Hello, you're a Chihuahua, mija. Beverly Hills Chihuahua. Own it on Disney Blu-ray and DVD today. Hi, I'm Felicia Rashad, and I've just started a new journey with Jenny Craig, one that will take me from this frame to that one. How am I going to get there? By eating the foods I like in proper portions, that's how. This is a plan I can stick to. I've already lost 10 pounds, so watch out. I'll be happily in my after before you know it. It's your final week to lose 20 pounds for $20 plus the cost of food. Call 1-800-JENNY-20. Care to join me on this journey? Call Jenny today. Everything's better at Macy's. We're known as the comedy store. Hey! Where did you get such a lovely outfit? Here at Macy's. Yes, I found a lot of cute things at Macy's. I saw her in Macy's, and she told me that she'd love to do it. Oh, you can find me any day at Macy's. What is Macy's? When Grandpa McMahon used to take little Eddie to Macy's. <laughs> Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade? We're going off to Macy's. Only one star has been a part of your life for 150 years. That's the magic of Macy's. Where does depression hurt? Everywhere. Who does depression hurt? Everyone. Depression is emotional, sadness, loss of interest, and it's physical too. Aches, pains, fatigue. Cymbalta can help. Cymbalta is a prescription medication that treats emotional and painful physical symptoms of depression. Tell your doctor right away if your depression worsens, you have unusual changes in behavior or thoughts of suicide. Antidepressants can increase these in children, teens, and young adults. Cymbalta is not approved for children under 18. People taking MAOIs or thyridazine or with uncontrolled glaucoma should not take Cymbalta. Taking it with NSAID pain relievers, aspirin, or blood thinners may increase bleeding risk. Severe liver problems, some fatal, were reported. Signs include abdominal pain and yellowing of the skin or eyes. Talk with your doctor about your medicines, including those for migraine, to avoid a possible life-threatening condition, about alcohol use, liver disease, and before you reduce or stop taking Cymbalta. Dizziness or fainting may occur upon standing. Side effects include nausea, dry mouth, and constipation. Ask your doctor about Cymbalta. Depression hurts. Cymbalta can help. Continuing the theme of going green, I want to focus on the lawn, because turf grass is the most resource-consuming plant of all. Each year, lawns are doused with millions of gallons of water, not to mention all manner of insecticides, herbicides, fungicides, and fertilizers. And every year, people and animals are unnecessarily exposed to potentially dangerous garden chemicals. And many of those chemicals have been identified by the EPA and the World Health Organization as probable carcinogens, endocrine disruptors, and reproductive toxins. In a recent study, Traces of lawn chemicals were found in 99% of 110 children tested. And it's estimated that up to 7 million birds die each year from exposure to lawn chemicals. And for what? Bragging rights? Hey, I like a nice lawn as much as the next gardener. And if you'd like to learn more about my approach to lawn care or anything else you've seen on today's show, just log on to HGTV.com. The surest way to make your lawn greener, so to speak, is to make it smaller. Add more garden beds or substitute ground covers, which don't require as much maintenance. Add water features and paths. Learn to live with weeds, at least a reasonable percentage of them. They promote biodiversity, they attract beneficial insects, and many of them are only seasonal anyway. Let the grass grow taller to shade out weeds, and if you absolutely can't stand looking at them, hand pull them rather than reach for some sort of herbicide. Hey, who doesn't need a little exercise? Water the lawn only when necessary. Walk across the grass, and if it doesn't spring back fairly quickly, it probably needs to be watered. Otherwise, wait a while and test it again. Instead of fertilizing four or five times a year, as is often suggested, Feed the lawn no more than twice a year using a slow-release, all-natural fertilizer or sifted compost. In many parts of the country, once is actually enough, and fall is the best season of all. If you've got a small property, consider using a push mower or an electric mower rather than one that runs on gas. And if it does run on gas, make sure it's a mulcher. Grass clippings are a rich source of nutrients, and wasting them is, well, a waste. <laughs> 